February 25th, 1975, Nashville, Tennessee. A young girl disappears while delivering Girl Scout cookies to a neighbor. The events that follow will destroy many lives and strip Nashville of its innocence. While the disappearance is one of many, it is one that Nashville will never forget. It is one that changed the city and its residents forever. Investigators relentlessly pursue their primary suspect until the 15-year-old is finally charged with murder. Unfortunately, that suspect will become yet another victim of the terrible events that took place in the affluent Green Hills neighborhood. Tonight, Incus will retell the disappearance of Marsha Trimble and the relentless investigation of the wrongfully accused Jeffrey Womack. March 28, 1965. Marcia is born to Charles and Virginia Trimble. She lives with her parents and her brother Chuck in the affluent Green Hills neighborhood in Nashville. Charles is a native of Nashville. He graduated from Montgomery Bell Academy and Vanderbilt. In 1975, he was working in sales for the industrial supply company Key Simmons. The family's three-bedroom, two-bathroom red brick home is located on Copeland Drive in one of the nicest and safest neighborhoods in the city. By all accounts, Marsh is an ordinary girl. She loves roller skating and watching Little House on the Prairie. Her favorite singer is Donny Osmond. While she likes snacking on hamburgers and powdered donuts, she'd rather have fruit, with one of our favorite foods being broccoli. A friend will say that Marsha is really sweet and fun in a goofy way. When she isn't skating, she spends her time writing and drawing. At one point, she writes an ominous story titled The Vanishing Treasure Chest about a girl named Beth who felt she has been haunted by two mysterious men. Nashville is growing rapidly. With that growth comes the problems so common in major cities across the country. February 25th, 1975, around 5.10 p.m., Marcia spends the day at home. Her mother, Virginia, is in the kitchen preparing dinner for the family. Her father, Charles, sits in the den. Her grandmother, Eunice, just dropped by the house with dessert. It was an ordinary day in Nashville, and nobody expected anything different. Marcia tells her mother that she's going to run across the street so she can drop off Girl Scout cookies at Marie Maxwell's house. She's wearing blue jeans, black boots, white socks, and a navy blue and white checkered blouse with a red and white trim collar. She carries a cardboard box holding Girl Scout cookies and an envelope containing approximately $20 she made selling cookies. 5.15 p.m. to 5.25 p.m. Marcia heads outside and is immediately stopped by her brother Chuck and his friend March. They're playing a game of horse and want to know if she wants to join in. Around this time, the neighbor, Marie Maxwell, arrives at home and begins unloading groceries. She lives directly across the street and can see Marcia through a hedge. 
she sees Marsha's backside along with two other people. Maxwell believes the smaller of the two is Chuck's friend, March. The taller figure appears to be a grown person in a long drab coat. She notices the cookie box the girl is holding, and she knows she owes her money. She heads inside to write a check before Marsha arrives. The game of horse ends and Chuck begins riding his scooter around the yard. March notices his mother leaving to pick up dinner, so he rushes over to tell her what he wants. Marsha Trimble will never make it to Marie Maxwell's house. 5.30 p.m. An eyewitness spots a girl who resembles Marsha near the corner of Hobbs and Estes, approximately three-tenths of a mile from her last known location. The witness would not see the cookie box. Approximately 5.35 p.m. Another eyewitness spots Marsha further up the street on Hobbs near a tree nursery. The girl does not have her cookie box and she looks confused. With dinner ready at home, Marsha's family begins to worry. Her mother Virginia steps outside, looks around and calls her daughter's name. She notices the family's dogs, Popcorn and Princess, are on the other side of the street. This is odd since they often follow Marsha around the neighborhood. 7 p.m. Charles Trimble calls his friend and police detective Sherman Nickens to ask for advice. He is told to drive through the neighborhood and see what he can find. He does, but Marsha is nowhere to be found. After returning home, Charles calls Sherman once again. Nickens drives to the Trimble home before youth guidance and homicide officers arrive at the scene. 9 p.m. The search for Marsha Trimble has grown considerably. The search team is now comprised of police officers, recruits, highway reserve officers, and members of civil defense units. Their flashlights illuminate the dark night as a helicopter soars overhead. Before too long, the story hits the media, and television reporter Oprah Winfrey with WTVF Channel 5 is knocking on the family's door with questions. She would be sent away empty-handed. The investigation soon turned into a media circus. 200 police officers strolled along the streets of the Green Hills neighborhood while reporters waited anxiously for any bit of news from investigators. Portable toilets were placed in the front yard of the Trimble property next to television cameras. It was common for curious locals to pass by out of morbid curiosity. Over the course of the investigation, authorities would learn that Marcia had a $5 bill that her grandmother had given her, and quarter wrappers with pennies in them. Those items would prove to be very important to investigators in the years to come. Unfortunately, nothing would be found for many, many days, and a killer would not be brought to justice until many years later. It was impossible to be in Nashville in 1975 and not hear Marcia Trimble's name. Her story was prominently featured in local newspapers and television broadcasts. While this encouraged locals to submit tips, many of those tips have proved to be unintended red herrings. Tipsters saw Marsh at Centennial Park, Clarksville Highway, in the town of Bucksnort, and even at the Canadian border. A television station received a tip that Trimble was being held hostage by an African-American family in East Nashville. Police would arrest a man who claimed on a CB radio that he had seen Marsha at the Haywood Lane exit of Interstate 24. Police searched with a fine-toothed comb in hopes of finding Marsha. They would search Priest Lake, Percy Warner Park, Radnor Lake, and any isolated area where a killer might have dumped a body. 
specially trained search dogs once used to search for Patty Hearst were brought in, but only time would unravel the mystery. Shortly after the disappearance, investigators would identify a suspect, and the age of that suspect would stun locals. They would attempt to pin the crime on 15-year-old Jeffrey Womack. Jeffrey was born and lived at 4102 Copeland Drive, just a block from the Temple home. When detectives caught up with Marie Maxwell, the neighbor across the street, she claimed she had looked through the hedge to see two people speaking with Marcia. She was 99% sure that the smaller of the two was March, the friend of Chuck. The other might have been Jeffrey Womack. Authorities found out that Jeffrey had walked to the home of Peggy Morgan around 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. on the day of the disappearance. Peggy noticed that Jeffrey was hot and sweaty, so she asked him about it. Jeffrey explained that he had been playing basketball. Morgan ran a daycare business, and Jeffrey was kind enough to babysit the kids from time to time. While questioning neighborhood kids about Marsha's whereabouts, one of the first officers on the scene, Tommy Jacobs, heard someone say Marsha had gone with Jeffrey Womack. Officers immediately went to the Womack house nearby, but Jeffrey was not there. Sometime between 9 and 10 p.m., Jeffrey learned authorities were looking for him. He walked to the Trimple house and agreed to speak with investigators. He spoke with Tommy Jacobs, Arthur C. Jackson, and Sherman Nickens in the makeshift police precinct in the Trimble family's bedroom. Jeffrey did his best to tell law enforcement everything he knew that night. He claims that he tried to answer their questions, but they would not let him finish what he was trying to say. They wanted Jeffrey to walk them through his day in five minute increments, but he couldn't do it. Things got worse when he was asked to empty his pockets. Out came a condom, a $5 bill, and a quarter wrapper with some pennies inside. Officers took a look at Walmack's arms to see if he had been abusing drugs. Then he was asked to take off his shoes. Officers found the words, fuck you, written on them. That was enough to cement Jeffrey Womack's status as the primary suspect in the death of Marcia Trimble. When Jeffrey's mother arrived, she informed authorities that they would need to speak with his lawyer. That immediately put an end to the interrogation of Jeffrey Womack. The Womack family would obtain legal assistance pro bono from attorney John Hollins, and he thought it was a good idea to give Jeffrey a polygraph test. Jeffrey would pass a private polygraph test with his attorney and another with the police department, but that just wasn't enough. He would end up taking five polygraph tests over the course of the investigation. The test concluded that Womack had been telling the truth when he denied being involved in the abduction and murder of his nine-year-old neighbor. The Trimble family would receive many strange calls after the disappearance. One came from a complete stranger who claimed to know where Marsha was being kept. He agreed to meet with Charlie at the Waverly Belmont School after dark, but he told him to bring money. When asked how much money was needed, the caller replied, just $300. He would also tell Marsha's father that he was not going to get killed over the dude who had his daughter. The stranger claimed two black men had Marsha at a safe house and he could show Charlie exactly where she was. The man warned Charlie not to just run into the safe house because they're Muslims, they will hurt him and he was deathly afraid of them. The property was searched, but Marcia was nowhere to be found, and the caller's claims were promptly dismissed. Another mysterious caller would lead police to Muhammad's Temple of Islam. The authorities backed off since they could not believe Marcia would be in the temple. 
Race relations were bad in Nashville at this time, so police suspected that someone was trying to provoke a shootout or ignite a race war between whites and blacks. As a result, they were hesitant to make any decision that could lead to a confrontation. Easter Sunday, March the 30th, 11 a.m. Memphis resident Harry Moffat scours through an old garage off Coughlin Drive. The structure is in pitiful shape with rotting wood and no windows. The garage sits behind the house owned by Moffat's relatives and it was only 200 yards from the Trimble home. While searching for a boat engine cover, Moffat notices legs underneath the clutter. He thinks it might be a doll, so he pokes the body with a stick. Soon, authorities are called, and the missing person's case transforms into a murder investigation. Marsha Trimble would have turned 10 years old just two days before the discovery of her body. The garage had been searched by authorities previously, leading some to suspect that the body was dumped sometime after the murder. However, most of the evidence showed that the girl had been left there undisturbed for 33 days. So many years later, the forensics show that Trimble likely walked into the garage voluntarily. Soil tests on her shoes proved that she likely was not dragged. Tests of generations of the insects found on her body suggest she had been lying there the entire time. The way the blood pooled in her body concluded the same. Sadly, the defenseless nine-year-old was either lured to her death or forced at knife or gunpoint. The money Marcia collected selling Girl Scout cookies was stolen, leading authorities to believe the murderer was a juvenile. The cause of death was ruled as strangulation it would take another four and a half years before the Trimble family would learn that Marcia had been sexually assaulted by her cold-blooded killer. With the discovery of the body, police nearly had enough to nab their primary suspect, Jeffrey Womack. The media knew that the case would be big, so they started following Jeffrey and getting as much footage of him as possible. They wanted to know everything about the suspect so they could be ready for the big arrest. Jeffrey had been hiding something from authorities all along, and it was something many thought would clear his name. Authorities eventually discovered the purpose of the condom in his pocket. The 15-year-old had been having a year-long affair with the 32-year-old woman he babysit for. Peggy Morgan. Some investigators thought the revelation made Jeffrey a better suspect and more than capable of sexually assaulting and murdering Marcia Trimble. More than two years after the murder in 1977, Jeffrey Womack was working as a dishwasher at the Jolly Ox restaurant. Authorities saw this as an opportunity so they placed an undercover officer in the restaurant in hopes of obtaining incriminating information on their suspect. One of Jeffrey's co-workers agreed to wear a wire as well. The tapes of those conversations have never been found, but the co-worker, Chris Richards, would share his side of the story with a local television station. Chris asked Jeffrey point blank if he killed Marsha Trimble. Jeffrey responded that he could never do anything like that, and Chris believed him. When asked why he came to that conclusion, he would say that Jeffrey was not that type of a person. In August of 1979, authorities were ready to make their move. After interviewing hundreds of witnesses, sifting through countless tips, and performing undercover work, it was finally time to arrest Jeffrey Womack. Assistant District Attorney Pat Appel 
spent almost an entire day putting together a plan to arrest a suspect. They wanted to surprise Jeffrey to prevent him from fleeing or killing himself. August the 28th, around 2 a.m. Four police cars surround the Parkside apartment complex where Jeffrey has been staying with his brother. Womack would be there to meet officers at the door wearing a pair of cut-off jeans and a Spatch restaurant t-shirt. He was barefooted. One of the seven arresting officers looked Jeffrey in the face and said, This is your day of reckoning. 20-year-old Jeffrey Womack would be booked on a charge of first-degree murder before being set free on a $25,000 bond. By this point, many suspected that Jeffrey Womack had committed the crime. Even his mother pleaded with him to tell the truth. She thought her son had done something, but she didn't know the full extent of his actions. It took investigators four and a half years to charge Jeffrey Womack with murder, yet their case would fall apart in just seven months. Attorney General Tom Shriver would break the news, saying there was not enough evidence to prove without a reasonable doubt that Jeffrey Womack committed the murder. However, he made it clear that Jeffrey would remain a suspect. Marsha's father, Charles Kincaid Trimble would never find out the truth. He passed away on September the 11th of 1989 at the age of 52. And investigators were not finished yet. In 1990, detectives paid a visit to the Burger King where Jeffrey was working. They had a new trick up their sleeve in the form of DNA. Womack would be taken to the Metropolitan Nashville General Hospital where hairs were collected from his arms, chest, groin, thighs, eyebrows, and mustache. A blood sample was collected before the probing finally came to an end. Detectives would hit a roadblock when Jeffrey's DNA did not match any of the evidence they had collected. Nevertheless, they stuck by their theory that Jeffrey Womack did in fact kill Marsha Trimble on February the 25th of 1975. They would attempt to press charges again, but the district attorney refused to prosecute. Authorities weren't ready to give up. Next time, they tried something a little more innovative. Authorities received a tip that Jeffrey may visit Marsha's grave and confess. On the 22nd anniversary of her death, police hit a camera with a microphone near her grave hoping to catch a remorseful killer. Jeffrey had only visited that cemetery once in 1991 for the burial of his father. Surprisingly, his father's grave is very close to that of his supposed victim. The camera microphone would never capture a confession from Jeffrey Womack he didn't have anything to confess. Marsha Trimble's body laid in the rundown garage for 33 days. It would take 33 years for police to finally identify the real killer and 34 to secure a conviction. This time the murderer's trail of destruction would finally catch up with them. Jerome Barrett had been in prison on six charges from 1974 to 2002, but he was free for about a year when Marsha went missing, and he would soon be connected to a handful of crimes. February 2nd, 1975. Vanderbilt University student Sarah Dez Prez is found murdered near the university, which is close to the Green Hills community. Her case will remain unsolved for many years. February 17, 1975. A Belmont University student is victimized by a sexual predator in Nashville. February 23, 1975. A 24-year-old woman is attacked on the front porch of her Fairfax Avenue apartment. 
The man's hands ripped open her shirt and fondled her breast. The woman fought back and told her attacker that a police officer lived in the house attached to the apartment. Her smart thinking saved her life and caused the attacker to flee the scene. March 1975 Jerome Barrett is arrested for the rape of the Belmont University student and convicted one year later. Nashville Metro's cold case unit used new DNA analysis technology on the evidence and found they had enough to charge Jerome Barrett with the murder of Sarah Des Perez. During the announcement of the arrest, police claimed it might be possible that Jerome was also responsible for the murder of Marsha Trimble. When Jerome was arrested in March of 1975, he was wearing a long, drab coat, just like the one Marie Maxwell mentioned. Unfortunately, that fact would be overlooked back then. Jerome worked in the area as a landscaper, with some suggesting he may have worked at the tree nursery where Marsha was last spotted. Authorities speculated that one of the two people spotted with Trimble in her driveway stole her cookies, causing her to chase them. Did she run right into the arms of her killer? All of Jerome's prior victims were petite and short in stature. The Girl Scout would have fit his criteria. Des Perez and Marsha were strangled to death, and semen was discovered on both victims. Jerome Barrett would be convicted in both cases and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Des Perez and 44 years for the murder of Girl Scout Marsha Trimble. Many years later, WSMV TV aired a documentary, Indelible, The Case Against Jeffrey Womack. In that documentary, investigators were confronted with a newspaper from March the 18th of 1975 just 12 days before Marsha's body was found. The newspaper featured a story and pictures of the man who killed Marsha Trimble, Jerome Sidney Barrett. The pictures were on the same page as the story about Marsha's disappearance. Most of those officers claimed they had never seen the newspaper before. While many questions have been answered, others remain. How did Jerome Barrett manage to kidnap and murder Marsha in a predominantly white neighborhood without being spotted? Why did it take police so long to discover the body despite searching the rundown garage before? Who was the mysterious caller that attempted to help police and the Trimble family? Why didn't police connect Jerome Barrett to the crime much sooner? The man who fought to defend Womack would pass away in January of 2016. Before his passing, John Holland Sr. would release a book about the saga called The Suspect, a memoir. He would also begin writing poetry and finish nearly 200 poems before his death. Jeffrey Womack would continue to live his life under scrutiny. When talking about the Marsha Trimble case, Nashville Police Captain Mickey Miller said, In that moment, Nashville lost its innocence. Every man, woman, and child knew that if something horrific could happen to that little girl, it could happen to anyone. It is equally frightening to know that anyone could end up in the same situation as Jeffrey Womack, the man who lost so many years of his life to so many unsubstantiated allegations.